Good morning. Thanks for coming to the Data Cloud Seminar Series. I'm Leif Nelson, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Eitan Green. In addition, we're joined by a, a set of really great panelists. So Hamza Bastani, Colin Kammerer, Jake Hoffman, Don Moore, Zayed Obermeyer, and Barry Plunkett. In addition, uh, Joe Simmons and Yuri Simonson will be here as well. All of us will try to uh, ask interesting questions or at the very least be polite while Eitan speaks. You'll all see at the bottom of your screen that there is a Q&A function. There's also a chat function, ignore it. Use the Q&A function. The questions or comments that you send will be seen by all of the panelists and when possible, we will voice them to Eitan so he can, uh, so he can respond to that. Um, and even if we don't get a chance to voice it, they get saved and we can share them with Eitan after, after the end of the talk. So thanks, and with that, uh, Eitan, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks so much, Leif, and thanks to Yuri and Joe as well for uh, inviting me. Uh, so this is joint work with Barry Plunkett, who's here with us today. Um, most of the work was done while Barry was an undergraduate at Penn. Uh, he has since graduated and moved on to greener pastures, uh, emphasis on green. So the motivation for this talk comes from my MBA negotiations class, where I am regularly asked a question for which I don't have a good answer, arguably the most fundamental question in all of negotiations, what offer should I make? We're going to try to answer this question in a very particular and highly structured context, that of best offer listings on eBay. So most of you may know of eBay as a place to buy random crap from somebody's attic. Uh, but many of you may think that it's a place to buy those items at auction. That, in fact, is not true. So these days, most items on eBay are sold in fixed price listings where the seller posts a price at which you can click buy it now. We'll call this the list price. And increasingly, these fixed price listings have what's called the best offer feature. So this button here, you can click make offer and make an offer for less than the list price. And at that point, you can go back and forth with the seller until you either agree or agree to disagree. Hey, Tom. So I was Yes. Eitan, we can't see your slides. Oh, uh oh. What is worth right up until that moment? We didn't need them, so no, no, no harm done. Well, thank you so much, Joe. Can you see them now? It says you are screen sharing. Uh, it says that, but I cannot see them. Oh, there we, we can. Yep. I can. Oh wait. No. Yep. That's good. Yes, you can see them. Yep. OK, great. So we were here. We were talking about this antique urn, this very nice antique brass urn that I was browsing for on eBay. It came from an archbishop home. So again, this is how best offer listings work on eBay. Buy it now price, best offer feature allows you to make an offer as the buyer for less than the list price and go back and forth with the seller until you either agree or agree to disagree. So I was searching on eBay for antique urns. This one was a little steep. Fortunately, I found this suitable replacement, uh, which in fact is from somebody's garage attic. OK, so what we're trying to do in this project is find the offer that maximizes some eventual payoff. And I'll be more clear about what I mean by that payoff later on. We want to do so for any listing that is for the antique brass urn or for the Folgers coffee can at any point in the negotiation. And we want to do it separately for the buyer and for the seller. And unfortunately, I'm only going to have time to talk about the results for the seller today. Moreover, what we want to do is characterize this optimal behavior in a manner that you can remember after this talk is over and potentially use when you go to buy and sell an antique urn on eBay. And in doing so, I think we're going to have some interesting things to say about human behavior, but you can be the judge of that. So perhaps you don't care about negotiation or you're like me, you didn't really think hard about negotiation until you were hired into a job in which you'd be teaching it. So for you and me, there's a larger goal here, which is to take a really powerful set of tools, a branch of machine learning called reinforcement learning out of its natural home in games like chess and into the real world, into the messy social science context that I think a lot of us care about. So what is reinforcement learning? So many of you may know about reinforcement learning from psychology it was developed as a theory to describe how animals learn. That is by experimenting and reinforcing actions that lead to desirable outcomes like food. So reinforcement learning in machine learning is a set of algorithms that are designed to find optimal strategies by experimenting and then reinforcing actions that lead to high payoffs or otherwise desirable outcomes. 
So ideally what we would do is we would take a reinforcement learning algorithm and just launch it on eBay, put it in the wild, have it make offers, see what works, and then reinforce the types of offers that lead to good outcomes. But the practical issue is that this would require millions of negotiations, really tens of millions of negotiations. And so what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna simulate eBay. Okay, we're gonna pioneer this alternative approach. We're gonna train, in particular, we're gonna take a very rich data set and we're gonna use that data set to train neural networks, which you can just think about as flexible models in high dimension to mimic the behavior of human buyers and sellers in the data. And this is gonna give us a simulator in which we can experiment for free. And so into the simulator, we're gonna inject our reinforcement learners to make offers, to see what happens and to learn to play optimally against these simulated buyers and sellers. Okay, so let me be specific about the goal. It's to play optimally against human buyers and sellers as we observe them in the data. What this implies is that what's optimal is not an equilibrium policy. That is, it's not a best response to a best response. It's the best response to how humans actually behave. So I'm gonna do four things relatively quickly so we can get into the results. The first of which is talk about how these best offer listings work. Can I ask you a conceptual question? We get started. Yeah, of course, you know about human human behavior, bit from humans playing with humans. If humans knew they were up against a neural learning super machine, would they change their behavior? And therefore, you're optimizing over something a situation that would only exist until they knew who they were playing against. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. So basically, because the fact that this is not an equilibrium strategy, it's going to be beatable. And it's going to be patently clear when you observe the results how you would beat this. Okay, so if you knew you were playing against the bot, there are things you could do to exploit its tendencies. So certainly. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so how do the, these best offer listings work? So when the seller lists an item, they set three prices. The first is a list price, the buy it now price, at which the item may be purchased immediately, and also two potential automatic thresholds. So an auto accept price above which buyer offers are immediately accepted and an auto reject price below which they're immediately rejected. And the buyer only observes the list price, not the automatic thresholds. So here's how things worked around 2013 when the data were collected. If a buyer shows up, the buyer may make an offer. And if the buyer doesn't press buy it now, the seller has an opportunity to respond. Okay, so if the offer is, is outside of these automatic thresholds, then eBay is going to respond on the seller's behalf by either automatically accepting or rejecting the offer. But otherwise, the seller can manually respond by accepting, making a counter offer, or rejecting. And if the seller doesn't respond within five minutes, it's as if the offer was rejected. Okay, things are somewhat symmetric on the buyer end. So if the seller doesn't accept the buyer's offer, then the buyer has an opportunity to respond. But there's an important difference. So if the buyer rejects, the seller doesn't have an opportunity to respond to the buyer's rejection. So effectively, it means the buyer chooses to walk. The buyer can't set these automatic thresholds. It has to respond manually. And so if the buyer doesn't respond in 48 hours, eBay decides that that's a rejection and the buyer walks. Okay, so steps two and three get repeated until the buyer and the seller have each had three turns. And after the third seller response, the buyer faces a take it or leave it decision. Okay, so the gantry is seven plies deep, three offers from the buyer, three offers from the seller, take it or leave it decision for the buyer. A thread is an interaction between a buyer and a seller and it ends when one of three things happens. When an offer is accepted either by the focal buyer or any other buyer, the buyer may choose to walk either actively by pressing reject or by passively by letting a seller offer expire or the listing may itself expire. Okay, so on to the data. Hey, Tom, these are single yes. issue negotiations in which there's very rarely a second issue brought into no, the negotiation. Only price. It's only price. Yeah, so one of the great benefits of this context, I think, for doing this type of work is that these interactions are highly structured and the, the types of things that you're, the dimension of the negotiation is, is very sparse. Okay, so these are essentially price negotiations. Okay, so the data come from a paper um, by Matt Backus and colleagues uh, published this year in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. Uh, the paper uses a data set that they released publicly. It contains the universe of these best offer listings on eBay over an 18 month period. It's nearly 100 million listings. Um, and remarkably, it includes the complete offer histories for all 
negotiations. So it's remarkable, not just in the scale of the data, how many listings are present, but in the fact that it includes everything that happens within these negotiations, every offer that's made. So at this point, I, I think we should just uh, appreciate uh, the amount of work that these authors put into releasing these data. Everything that we're doing here wouldn't be possible without it. Okay, so we're gonna impose two pretty severe restrictions on the data. So first we're gonna throw out all listings that don't have a unique title. And this is to restrict to items that are plausible unique. And we're doing this for a number of reasons. Uh, an important one is we don't wanna be bargaining or figuring out how to bargain over items that have a market price, like an iPhone. We wanna be bargaining over things like antique brass urns, okay, for which the market price is less clear. And the second thing we're gonna do is adopt a restriction that the Bacchus paper uses, which is to throw out a small number of items with very high list prices, but also a much larger number of items with very low list prices for which there's really nothing to bargain over. So this is gonna leave us with 13 points things from about three quarters of a million sellers. We're gonna split them into four partitions by seller. So the vast majority of our data is gonna go into a data set that we're gonna to use to train these neural networks that mimic the behavior of buyers and sellers. We're gonna use 10% of the data to train the reinforcement learners, 5% to tune these training procedures and the rest for showing results. But let me just say that the results that I'm gonna show you today come entirely from the validation partition. We haven't touched the test partition. This is just for uh, the moment that this paper is on the verge of being accepted, whenever that might be. So let me tell you about how this simulator works. So um, imagine we see a listing like this. The list price is $100 and the, the seller sets a $60 auto reject price, but no auto accept price. And in the data, what happens is the item sells for the list price to the first buyer. Now, what we wanna do is think about what might've happened had we simply rewound time and press play on this listing again. What counterfactual offer path might we have we observed? So perhaps here's one plausible counterfactual. The first buyer instead offers $50. We know what would have happened. The seller would have auto-rejected this, this offer. The buyer may then increase their offer to $75. And in the intervening time in which the seller has to respond, perhaps a second buyer came along and purchased the item for the list price. Okay, so it's these types of counterfactuals that will allow us to say what might have happened had the first buyer say offer $50 instead of $100. And okay, so here's how the simulator works. We wanna simulate two things, the arrival process of buyers and the offer path of each interaction between a buyer and the seller. Okay, what we're not gonna simulate is everything that we observe about the listing. So for instance, the list price, we're not gonna generate counterfactuals that say what might've happened had the seller offered this item or listed it under a different price. And we're gonna enforce the automatic thresholds as we observe them in the data. And the point of this is just to ensure that the counterfactuals that we're genera generating are credible. So we don't think that we could generate credible counterfactuals under potentially a different list price. Okay, and then listings in our simulation are gonna expire after one week, which is a common listing duration of the data. So- Can I take advantage of you drinking your coffee to ask a question? Uh, I saw my opening. Um, what fraction, like one of the nice things about this setting, um, which is awesome, is that you kind of see the information that's usually private to like the seller. And it seems like the distillation of that is that um, range of auto accept and auto reject. So in those particularly clean examples, what fraction do those make up of your data set? Yeah, so uh, about 20, 25% of listings have uh, an auto accept or an auto reject price. Uh, so the majority, though not uh, 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 overwhelming majority have neither. So I guess I had a, so th this simulator at first sounded a little bit like an imitation learning problem to me because you're trying to look at sample paths and infer like what their policy is. But I guess it's different because there, I think usually you provide some sort of action, state action pairs, whereas here you're providing some sort of counterfactuals. Is there a connection or? Do you guys uh, let me just walk you through exactly how this works. And I, I think the answer will, will become more clear. Um, 
So the first thing that our simulator has to predict is when the first buyer arrives, if at all. So we can go into, into the data and we can look at the distribution of the arrival time of the first buyer, where the listing window here is just one week. So note, first of all, that 70% of listings expire without a single buyer arrival. Okay, so there's a lot of crap on eBay. Um, but when we see an arrival, it has this, you know, the sinusoidal pattern indicating that people show up typically at the beginning of the listing, but also during the day rather than the middle of the night. Okay, and so what we want to do first is we want to um, train a neural net that takes in all of the features that we observe about the listing, the list price, and so on and so forth, hundreds of features, and predict a distribution of arrival times for the first buyer. And so when I show you this overlay of what we generate in our simulations, that is not the conditional distribution for a given listing. That is what happens when we draw from those predicted distributions for each listing okay? and generate a distribution of those draws. And what's remarkable here, at least in our perspective, is that we can do a pretty credible job at recreating that full distribution. So we do this with about two dozen times for different quantities. We have to predict, say, the inner arrival time between buyers. We also have to predict the buyer's experience. Mm -hmm. When a buyer arrives, how many best offer listings they've participated in the past, the time between offers and the offers themselves. I'm not going to show you comparable figures to what I showed you on the previous slide, but let me just say that basically the match between the distribution that we generate in our simulations and the distribution that we observe in the data is just as good for all of these models. The way that I'm going to try to convince you that our simulation is doing a good job at generating counterfactual offer paths is to tell you about this, this other thing we train called a discriminator. So this is just another neural net that observes a complete offer history from either the data or from one of our simulations. Okay, so it's either it's observing an interaction between a buyer and a seller that's either real or fake. And by fake, I mean generated by us. And what it's observing is two things. So it's observing the fixed listing features like the list price. And those are the same regardless of whether they come from the data or from the simulations. But then in addition, it's also observing the offer path. So the sequence of offers that are made between a buyer and the seller. And it has to say, is that thread real or is that thread simulated? Okay. And so the goal when we typically or train a prediction model is to have it predict well, to have it be able to discriminate. But what we want here is the opposite. We want the discriminator to fail to discriminate because that will give us some confidence that our simulator is doing a good job at creating counterfactual offer paths that are credible. Okay, and so the way we measure the performance of the simulator is through the area under the curve. So the area under the curve is 100% when the discriminator does a perfect job at discriminating and it's 50% when it is basically guessing at random chance. Uh, and so the area under the curve for our discriminator is 56%, which is a lot closer to random guessing than it is to perfect discrimination. And so this gives us some confidence that our discriminator is doing a pretty good job at generating these counterfactual offer paths. Ethan, I had one quick idea that I wonder if um, you'd tried or thought about, which is, uh, so that that's kind of nice, although it's also, you wouldn't expect that unobservables, that discriminator would do better at discriminating fake, like, like that, that's reassuring, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what you want to know. Yep. So I wonder if you could use that, um, the difference between the ones where you don't have auto accept and reject and the ones where you do. So if you, if you kind of train on the, the examples where you don't know exactly what the buyer or the seller is range is and apply mm -hmm. that to the ones where the, the seller has explicitly told you their min and max, do you do a good job of predicting those paths where you have more information? Yeah, I, I mean, I think remarkably just by an accident of the way that we've done this project is, uh, so we, we went through the whole process throwing out uh, listings in which there was an auto accept price. Um, and when you do that, keeping ones with an auto reject, but throwing out those with an auto accept price. And when you do that, the area under the curve is 53%. Oh, so awesome. give, giving it the, the little bit of information about the auto accept price uh, makes it a little bit better at, at predicting. Uh, which That's is very cool. Interesting. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about before showing you the results is just how we train this thing. And so to do this, I'm gonna introduce just the slightest bit of notation. Okay, so what we're doing is we're trying to train a policy, which I'll denote pi, that is just a mapping between a large set of features and an action 
or a distribution of actions that maximizes some eventual payoff. And why we call this deep reinforcement learning is because it uses deep learning, it uses neural nets. This arrow here, this mapping between the features and the action is done through a high dimensional flexible function called a neural network. So let me just make this concrete by talking about how this works in chess. X here represent features that describe where the pieces are located on the board. And the action that you can take is just an allowable move. Okay, what about for best offer listings on eBay? Well, so X are basically all the features that our seller can observe that we observe as well. So these are the features of the listing, like the list price and the hundreds of other features that we observe about the item and the listing, as well as features that describe what's happened in the negotiation up to this point. And we also try to create a lot of features that help the seller observe things in our simulations that the seller observes in real life. So for instance, we create features that allow the seller to observe what is happening on other threads when it responds to a given buyer. And so for instance, it knows what the best offer it has from other buyers is when it responds to the focal buyer. What about the action space? What actions can our seller take in these simulations? So we restrict the action space in two ways. So first of all, we don't let the seller choose when it arrives. It basically makes an offer when a human would. All it's making a decision over is what that offer is. And so the offers that we allow it to make are the extreme offers, to either accept, to reject actively, or to let the buyer's offer expire. And then we give it six, the six most common concessions that we observe in the data. And the reason that we limit the set of concessions that the seller can make is because we want to make sure that the seller basically acts in such a way as to stay within the data. Okay, so the concessions here, a concession of one half is a split the difference offer. It basically means the buyer has offered one thing, the seller previously had offered something else, one half says, let me meet you right in the middle. Okay, we might wanna know, for instance, what would happen if the seller makes an incredibly small concession, but we just don't observe that sufficiently in the data to say with any confidence uh, that our, our counterfactuals would be credible given that behavior. So here's how training works. So we start by initializing this policy to something random such that regardless of the features that the policy observes, it basically outputs a uniform distribution over those possible actions. Then we just randomly draw a listing from the training partition and we go back to our simulator to simulate the arrival process of buyers and the offer path that is the interaction between the buyer and the seller. Instead, but the caveat here is that instead of using the models that we have trained, to produce offers that mimic the offers that sellers make in the data, we're instead gonna use this seller policy pie. Okay, and so when the listing ends, the seller receives a payoff, and we're simply gonna update our policy to reinforce actions that lead to high payoffs. And we're gonna do this about 10 million times until this policy converges to something deterministic. Hey, Eitan, just a clarifying question. So yeah. at this point, once you have the simulator trained, the real offer paths don't play into this now. They're always responding to the simulated offer paths, right? That's right. That's right. The data is just used to train those neural nets that comprise the simulator. So we've injected our reinforcement learner into that simulated environment. When you're treating that output vector as like a set of discrete actions, or let me just, I could have imagined another way of doing it, which is like learn the, like some continuous output and then discretize it, which would let you kind of learn some smooth function that might actually help. I wonder like what, um, yeah, how did you see the trade-off of like, obviously the, you're using the same feature set to output these different kind of discrete things. So I know you're learning about the different things from the same feature set, but yeah, did you think about doing it as just like a smooth? Um, yeah, I, I, I spent like a month of my life trying to basically have the output be a, a, a discrete beta mixture model. So you have a beta distribution over zero one plus you know, options for accept, reject, and expire. Uh, and basically coding up the beta CEF, just it, it chokes, it chokes. Um, so that's one reason we abandoned it. But the other reason is, uh, you just can't enforce staying on the types of offers that we observe uh, when you have the offer space be continuous. 
um, because basically it could do something that's epsilon different from any of these potential concessions, and, and that would immediately take it into a place that we don't typically observe in the data. Oh, but you could christen it out, like just you could fix it in post or something. Like that. It's just it's much easier, uh, and training time is much faster if you just use a categorical distribution. Okay, so what I haven't answered yet is what is the payoff to the seller? And at, at a high level, conceptually, this is straightforward. If the item sells, well, what does the seller have? They, they get some amount of money, the sale price. But what happens if the item doesn't sell? Well, then the seller doesn't have any money in their hand. They're left with this antique grass urn. And that's in theory worth something to them. And whatever it's worth to them is discounted by this parameter delta between zero and one. That's gonna capture a bunch of stuff. So it's gonna capture the fact that sellers may be impatient, they may, may be averse to the possibility that their item doesn't sell, the fact that items that don't sell on eBay may become stale, and that sellers have to pay some fees even when their item doesn't sell. So this, this still leaves us with this thorny issue of what is the value of an item? And this is an issue that plagues all negotiation research and is one reason why most negotiation research is done in the laboratory where you can assign people evaluation. We obviously can't do that here, so we have to do something else. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate a quote unquote market value for each item by simulating it many times. We'll go back to our simulator and just simulate this listing, you know, a thousand times. Um, and we're gonna characterize optical behavior under these values. So let me just be clear about what the seller is maximizing. The expected reward is basically the probability the item sells times whatever the sale price is, the expected sale price. There's some probability the item doesn't sell. In that case, they get the discounted value of the item. So the value and the discount, these are fixed, but when the seller acts, they change the probability of the item sells and they change the price at which it would sell for. Okay. So at this point, I think we can spend the rest of the time talking about what this seller actually does. So let me start with an important performance metric. So this is the sale price normalized by the list price. And I'm looking here within the data and I'm showing you a CDF of these normalized sale prices for all valid listings. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So let's just start here at the left axis. A sale price of zero indicates that the item didn't sell. And we see that among these valid listings here in the data, 20% of items don't sell. So by valid, I mean the listing presents the seller with an opportunity to act. So most listings don't. For most listings, a buyer doesn't arrive. The seller doesn't have an opportunity to respond. So we're not including those here. We can look all the way on the right. A sale price of one or a normalized sale price of one this indicates that the buyer paid the full list price. We see that happens 7% of the time among valid listings. We're also here excluding instances for which, say, a buyer arrives and immediately pays the full list price. Okay, that's another instance in which the seller doesn't have an opportunity to respond. Okay, so everything I show you is gonna be restricted to these valid listings. Should also point out there are some common fractions at which items are likely to sell, like for instance, 80% of the sale price. Sorry, can I ask a clarifying? I probably should have yeah. asked earlier. So your discriminator, you're saying that you're able to reliably simulate um, threads for some subset of things, right? Like presumably the predictive performance and for the discriminator is not uniform. Are you taking that distribution into account? Like, is there some subset of products or subset of sellers where you can reliably produce these threads? Well, I, I think that we can do it for basically every listing. So one okay. thing that's nice about the discriminator is it, it's, it, it's basically never able to say with certainty whether it's uh, a thread from the data or a simulated thread. Uh, and so it only basically gets the AUC up, up above 50% by being a little bit better than 50% and it's guessing for some listings. And I can just tell you what are the listings that it's not doing a great job of of simulating, it's those listings for which we get a ton of buyers arrive in short sequence. So mm -hmm. there are some, sometimes in the data, you have a very, very popular listing and like eight buyers will arrive within the first hour. Because of the way that we basically construct uh, the output of the, the neural net that predicts the inner arrival time, we just can't repu replicate that type of uh, um, buyer arrival path in quick succession. So those are the types of listings that, I, that we're not gonna be able to credibly simulate the same type of buyer arrival um, 
uh, situation that we observe in the data. So in these results, like you think the product distribution is pretty uniform, I guess, though for which you're able to get good counterfactuals. Oh, good, good simulations from the net. Like I'm yeah. just asking there's an off distribution problem here, but it sounds like you're saying no. Oh, right. So, so that, right. So we're doing a lot to basically make sure that the agent stays within the distribution of, of offer paths that we observe in the data. Okay, so we estimate or we train two agents with different values of delta. So the first, this blue line represents uh, an agent uh, that is perfectly impatient. So they have a value of delta of zero. So if they don't sell the item, what is it worth to them afterwards? It's worth nothing. So we're motivating these agents to try to sell as many listings as possible, and that's what they do. So if we look at the left edge here, we see that only about 10% or less of these valid listings go unsold. That is when the seller has an opportunity to respond. But what's remarkable is that the seller is nonetheless able to sell many more items for exactly the list price than humans are in the data. It's about 20% of these listings sell for the list price compared to about 7% in the data. And in fact, this blue distribution stochastically dominates the, the black distribution which is to say that, that there's no moment of the distribution for which humans are doing better by this metric than this agent is. Okay, so the, the other agent that we estimate is one with a delta of 0.7 and we choose 0.7 because this essentially equalizes the rate here at which the agent chooses not to sell items with the rate at which we observe humans choosing not to sell these same items. Okay, so in some sense, this is the most comparable agent to the humans in the data. And what's remarkable again is just the share of listings that it's able to sell for exactly the list price. So this, it's a third, a full third of listings. It's selling for exactly the list price, five times as many as, as what we observe in the data. Okay, so when we overlay both of these plots, we can see the trade-off here as we make the agent more impatient we force it to sell more items. And the cost of that, the trade-off is that it's able to sell fewer of them for the list price. But nonetheless, it's able to sell many items for the list price. And so when we saw this result, our, our first inclination was, well, it must be the case that what's happening is buyers, the, the agent is just waiting for more buyers to arrive, right? Waiting for a later buyer to come along and pay the full buy and now price. That's not true. So here on the left, I'm showing you the distribution of first offers that buyers make in the data that is for humans and then in our simulations with either agent and the distributions are essentially overlapping. Okay, so we can quibble about the shares of listings that sell for exactly the list price, but they can't possibly explain the large divergence we saw on the previous slide in terms of the share of listings that sell for the list price between the agents and the, the humans. Okay, so where we see that divergence is in turn three. So remember turn one is when the buyer makes the first offer, turn two is the seller's response, turn three is the buyer's response. And what we see here is that in the data, very few of these turn three offers are for the full list price, but not so with the agents. Okay, so something is happening in the negotiation, particularly in turn two, that's allowing these sellers to basically induce full price offers from these buyers in turn three. Okay, so let me show you what happens in the data in turn two. So I'm showing you three figures that all have the same horizontal axis. The horizontal axis is the normalized offer price, the first offer is as a share of the list price. As we move to the right, the first offer becomes more generous. The vertical axis differs between a slide or between um, panels here. So on the left, it's the probability that the seller rejects in turn two. In the middle, it's the probability that the seller makes a counter offer. On the right, the probability that the seller accepts. And so what are sellers doing in response to first offers? They're doing something incredibly intuitive. They are rejecting generous offers at a lower rate. As the offer becomes more generous, they're countering less often and they're accepting much more often. Okay, so you make me a very generous offer and I'm more likely to accept it. Okay, but here's what's remarkable what, about what the agents are doing. They're doing the opposite. Okay, so this is that same panel from the left on the previous slide where the vertical axis is the probability the seller rejects in turn two. So I've overlaid the same estimate from the data as we saw before, but here's what our agents are doing, okay? 
So our impatient agent in particular is rejecting more often as the first offer becomes more generous. Okay, and to a lesser extent, that's true of our more patient agent. And as we get to the most generous offers that we typically see like 90% of the list price, what we see in the data is that humans reject these offers only 10% of the time compared to almost 60% of the time for our inpatient agent and 80% of the time for our more patient agent. Okay, so this is surprising to the least. Um, why on earth is this happening? Let me tell you. So it's, it's happening because generous first offers are signaling a high willingness to pay on the part of the buyer. Okay, when you make a generous first offer, when you offer 90% of the list price, you're saying, I really want your Folgers coffee can. Okay, and the agents understand this in a way that the humans don't. Okay, so let me just show you this in the data. So I'm gonna show you three plots that all have the same axes, but they're conditioned on different first offers. So here are the, yes. So I hate to interrupt you because you have good momentum. Uh, but you characterize it as human, the machine recognizes but humans don't. Is it possible that humans are polite and your machine is impolite? That is, yeah, if someone offers so, me 90% of the, of the list price, I'm like, oh, that's nice. I don't want to be a jerk and ask for 95%. But your agent has no morals, so it, it's comfortable. That, that is absolutely correct. So what I'm characterizing as optimal is just a strategy that maximizes the amount of money that you get, you know, conditional on some valuation. Um, but certainly, I think you could rationalize the discrepancies that we see here between the agent and the seller through things like an aversion to bargaining. And I think that explanation that you gave sort of fits into that rubric. I guess maybe relevant to that, Ashton Anderson asked, like, should choosing a list price be part of the seller policy we'd like to characterize? So I guess part of this willingness to pay information you're getting is because you're saying it's 90% of the list price. Yeah, so I think a better version of this paper would be able to explore that counterfactual and build that into the seller's uh, action space. Um, but you know, we, we don't observe intrinsically how much an item is worth. And so we have to basically rely on features like the list price to help us infer that, like to help our simulations infer that basically. And so I think that if we allowed the agent to change the list price, we would get into the world where we just don't believe these counterfactuals because then what the simulator would be doing is it basically be looking at items with that new list price and seeing our negotiations occur for, for that very potentially very different subset of items. And is it um, it's on different, like if you look at items where the list price looks higher in your distribution of like likely list prices versus lower, like if I've set a list price that's like obviously too high because I'm, I'm starting the negotiation there, does that change how yeah, I, I mean, accept so the offers that are Right, high? so we, we don't know what constitutes a list price that's inflated versus deflated. Um, there are features in the data that give us a very strong sense. So for instance, the more experienced you are as a seller, the less likely you are to sell your items and you sell them for a smaller percentage of the list price. And that's probably because the more experienced you are as a seller, the more you inflate the list prices that you post. So I think our simulations can do a decent job of teasing that out, but we don't observe that directly, obviously. Alex Reese Jones is wondering about the opportunity cost of the agent's time and whether the agent is reluctant to waste their time going three rounds or whether you treat that opportunity cost as zero. Yeah, so we, we obviously treat that opportunity cost as zero. So I'd fold that basically into my response to Leif's question uh, that you can rationalize what humans are doing based on an aversion to bargaining. Let me just say one more thing in response to Alex's very good question, which is that if you look at what agents are doing in response to um, generous offers for list prices, for items with list prices that are very high, so very expensive items for which you may wanna put a little more effort into bargaining, you basically see the same behavior on the part of the agent. So it's still rejecting generous first offers at high rates. A uh, quick Colin Cameron here, a quick comment, which is um, this might be understood uh, the, what the humans are not are not doing from the point of view of profit maximization might be understood as um, 
an example of non-equilibrium game theory where they're failing to infer in cursed equilibrium, for example, that is that some private information that the buyer has and they're not inferring it from how aggressively they're offering. Um, and I think I, I think there's there's a paper somebody could write, which you probably don't want to, um, about the, using the discrepancy between the human behavior and the agent behavior to tell us something about a kind of essentially a cognitive mistake the agents are making. Um, and we see this in some other domains like movie reviews where failing to get a movie review out for your movie is actually means it's pretty bad. But people who go to the movies don't necessarily see that. The, the structural modeling is a giant pain in the neck and it's a big headache, but there's a lot of people on this call who could figure it out. Um, yeah, I mean, Colin, I'm very sympathetic to that interpretation. Um, I think the difficulty with writing that paper with these data is that there are competing interpretations uh, like yeah. the, the type that Leif um, and Alex have, have ventured. Yeah, no, no question, that's the, that's the hard part. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm uh, trying explicitly not to use the word mistake here to describe anything that the humans are doing. I think it's fully rational, rationalized by a lot of types of behaviors uh, that are really quite rational, like not wanting to spend time negotiating. But I think there's mm -hmm. also an element of sort of not understanding this logic. Okay, so, so let me just show you this logic in the, in the data. Um, so I'm gonna show you three charts um, in which the horizontal and vertical axes are the same and I'm just conditioning on different uh, first offers. So here we're looking at instances in which the first buyer offer is two thirds of the list price. On the horizontal axis is the response from the seller. So a concession of zero is a rejection, a concession of one is an acceptance, a concession of 50% says, well, I offered you the full list price. You said two thirds, I'll offer you five sixths. So right in the middle. Okay, the first thing to note is that this estimate, this relationship between the size of the concession and on the vertical axis, the probability that the buyer then accepts in turn three is increasing. The more generous the seller is in their response, the more likely the buyer is to say yes. But what I wanna draw your attention to is what happens when the, when the seller rejects. Okay, so here a rejection means, nope, you gotta pay the full list price and then induces buyers to then say, okay, I'll pay the full list price 15% of the time, which is equivalent to the rate that you get when you concede 25% of the bargaining zone, okay, without having to concede anything. What happens when the buyer offers three quarters of the list price? Okay, so well now a rejection, this is all in the data, by the way. Now a rejection induces buyers to accept 30% of the time, which is equivalent to almost a 40% concession. And when buyers offer four fifths of the list price, 80%, and you say no as a seller, buyers turn around and say, okay, I'll pay the full list price 50% of the time, which is equivalent to the accept rate you get by conceding half of the bargaining zone. All right, so conceding in this case, 10% of the list price. Okay, so the first thing to note is that as the buyer's first offer becomes more generous, their response, the probability with which they accept in response to a rejection increases. So what they're saying with their generous offer is, if you say no, I'll just pay the full price. Okay, but the other thing to note is just the gap here between the performance of a rejection and the performance of a small concession. So, what a rejection is saying is, nope, my price is firm. What a small concession is saying, apparently, is hmm, actually my price is not firm. And so what these buyers are doing in response to a small concession is they're turning around and asking for another concession from the seller. Okay, so this I think is somewhat remarkable because when you as a seller list your item on eBay with a best offer feature, you're signaling to the buyer, you didn't have to put in that button that says make offer, but you're, you're do, you're, when you do that, you're telling the buyer, I'm willing to take offers that are less than the list price. But if you turn around and just reject the buyer's offer, you're able to nonetheless restore some sense that your fake list price is in some way firm. Okay, so I think the summary so far is that what human sellers are doing is they're accepting generous first offers, which is consistent with the logic of just simply comparing the offer to one's reservation value or to their goal. What the agents are doing instead is they're rejecting generous first offers, which induced full price offers from the buyers. And this is consistent with a wholly different psychology, that of inferring the buyer's willingness to pay from the offer that they're making. Okay, so it's outward facing. Okay, so agents are also making a second important inference 
And that is that generous, and in particular, early first offers tell you something about the popularity of your listing, that they predict that another buyer will arrive soon. And this is particularly important because it ensures, this logic ensures against the downside risk of rejecting generous first offers, which is that the buyer may just choose to walk away. Okay, so let me just show you this logic in the data. So on the horizontal axis, we have the time it takes for the first buyer to arrive in days. And on the vertical axis, the inner arrival time between the first two buyers in days. Okay, so how long it takes after the first buyer arrives for the second buyer to show up. And I'm showing you this separately for three first offers, half the list price, two thirds and four fifths. Okay, so the first thing to note is that these lines are all increasing. So the later the first buyer arrives, the longer you're gonna to have to expect between the first buyer's arrival and the second. Okay, but as we look separately at these lines, we see that when the first offer is particularly generous and early, well, if it comes shortly after the listing begins, you should expect the next buyer to show up about a day later. But if that first offer comes at the same time and is considerably less generous, you should expect something like more or less three days until the next buyer comes. Okay, so what does it say? It says the generous and in particular early first offers predict that another buyer is gonna arrive soon. Okay, so the, the last thing that I wanna do is, is just show you, convince you that, that the seller agents, that our reinforcement learners are taking this logic to heart. And I'm gonna do this slightly differently. Um, our agents are super complicated objects and it's kind of hard to sort of open the box and see what they're doing. And so we're, we're gonna try something else out. What I'm gonna do is train what I'll call a heuristic agent. So it is just a simplified version of what our complex neural net is doing and one that is interpretable. So what's happening here? So we're taking all of the actions that our impatient agent takes and we're saying, okay, in turn two, can we train a simple single cut decision tree to best predict the actions that the seller takes. What do I mean by a simple sim single cut decision tree? I mean that it chooses one feature, here that feature is called elapsed, and it chooses one cut of that feature, and then actions on either side of that threshold. Okay, and it wants to choose the feature and the threshold and the corresponding actions to best predict the actions that this agent is taking in our simulations. Okay, and in turn two, the feature that it chooses is not the first offer that the buyer makes, it's instead how much time has elapsed since the listing began. Okay, and if not too much time has elapsed, this variable runs from zero to one, so 0 0.38 is about the first three days more or less, it rejects, otherwise it accepts. In turns four and six, it's making its split decision based on the offer that the buyer made in the previous turn, but regardless of the threshold, its response is pretty generous to either make a 50-50 offer or to accept what the buyer has been offering. Okay, so when is this agent rejecting? It's rejecting early in the listing window and also early in the game tree. Okay, so in turn two, when that offer comes early in the listing. What if we go to our more patient agent? So here, what's remarkable is that this agent, this heuristic agent, is not even at any point considering the offer that the buyer is making. Okay, all it's considering is when this offer has arrived. So in turn two, if it's arrived like four days into the listing or less, it will reject. In turn four, like two days into the listing or less, something like that. And in turn six, it just accepts. So at this point, you know, you may be saying, well, well these, these heuristic agents are incredibly simple, but doesn't, isn't there a cost to that simplicity? They must be performing poorly, right? They're observing one or two features rather than the full hundreds uh, that our, our neural net, our full agent observes. And the, the answer is surprising to us that these heuristic agents actually perform nearly as well as our much more complicated um, agents that we train. So this performance metric that I'm showing you is the reward, the normalized reward that our agents are trying to maximize. So in the case of the item sells, it's the sale price. In the case of the item doesn't sell, it's the discounted value of the item. So the first thing to note is that the agent is doing better than the humans, as we should expect, at least by this metric, because it's trying to maximize this outcome. Uh, it's doing about six to eight percentage points better, depending on what, which agent we're looking at. 
but this heuristic closes nearly the entirety of the gap. Okay, it's closing about two thirds or even four fifths of the gap. This simple single cut decision tree. Okay, that's, that's basically internalizing one or two features. Okay, so this takes me back to the question that I asked at the beginning, what offer should I make? And so if the question is what offer should I make as the seller, I, I think the answer is quite simple that you should do what these heuristics are doing. They'll allow you to perform nearly as well as our agent, uh, but with just a simple rule of thumb that potentially you can remember hereafter. You, you can, just a quick clarification, yeah. just want to make sure, like you use the same training test setup to train these simple agents as the big agents, or is it a different setup? Yeah, I mean, we're, so we're not terribly worried about um, uh, overfitting these single cut decision trees. So these are trained in the validation set. But certainly I think when the paper is published, these could be trained in the validation set and this could reflect the test set. We just didn't want to create another partition. But I wouldn't Can you go? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I wouldn't expect uh, this performance to suffer. Could you go back to the impatient heuristic for a sec? Okay. So I guess one question we could ask ourselves is, does, does this agent feel like a jerk um, or someone unpleasant to negotiate with, right? Because this one we can reason about. Uh, the patient one seems fine. It just waits based on time, right? Yeah, you, what, why does it strike you as a jerk? No, I'm not saying it necessarily does. Um, but you know, this idea that it was extracting maximal willingness to pay by behaving very differently than humans in the, with the full neural net uh, by rejecting things that signal a high willingness to pay. Um, you know, I, I just thought it would be interesting to try to look at this simplified version and see, you know, does it seem like you would not want to bargain with this heuristic agent in the long term? Yeah, I mean, okay, so, so one way to think about the answer to that question is we are, and this is to, to uh, in response to Don's question as well at the beginning, um, we're basically looking at these highly structured interactions that are a one-off, right? So you typically don't buy lots of the same antique urns from the same buyer over and over again. Uh, and so I think the cost of, of being a jerk here is a lot less than it is in many negotiations where there's repeated interaction. And so certainly I think, you know, one of the big downsides of this context is that it is a very distilled uh, version of the com really complex types of negotiations that we think about uh, when we think about negotiation and may not apply to circumstances in which, for instance, there's repeated interactions uh, between the buyer and the seller. But that said, I mean, rejecting offers that come in early, does that make you a jerk? No, right? It doesn't seem unreasonable, I guess, is, is my sense. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah I, I don't think that you would suffer in the long term as a seller on eBay if you adopted this strategy. Okay, I, I only have four more words in my talk, which is that if you want to know what offer you should make as the seller, you should abide by the heuristics that we've shown that do quite well and to reject early and concede late. If you want me to expand this to six words, I might say reject generous offers early, concede late. But that's all I have. So I think we have a couple more minutes for questions. Jen Daniels challenges you to think about generalizing uh, beyond the stylized paradigm uh, that you've been working into other single issue negotiations. Um, what are the dimensions along which I should generalize? <laughs> she doesn't specify. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to ad lib. Um, no, this is the, the, the downside. You know, I, I feel like my, my default response to questions in a human seminar is to ask the questioner another question and I guess Zoom <laughs> doesn't, well, doesn't allow that. She, she dodged that possibility by not being, uh, not being there to, to respond to your question. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, one of the things that makes this, this uh, environment workable for us is the fact that all of the 
uh, things that make negotiations interesting, or at least most of them are, are not present in this environment, like how you talk to somebody when you relay their offer. You know, what media do you use, like the phone or the text? Uh, like just your word choice, which is, you know, something that in our negotiations class we talk about extensively, none of this is really available to you uh, in this uh, online interaction. Um, and I think my answer is disappointing, like we can't really say anything about like how you should frame your offer, like what words you should choose that this type of uh, exercise doesn't really allow us to say anything interesting in that regard. Well, presumably, if you learn a structure of an optimal policy when you're generalizing to other contexts, maybe you can regularize it in some intelligent way. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be a, a really interesting next step to use other tools for machine learning to basically say, how can we apply this model to some other uh, environment? Um, I, I mean, just a larger point on that, one of the big failures of machine learning is what's called transfer learning. Uh, is, is you know, learning a policy in one environment and being able to use it to good effect in, in, a, in a different one. I mean, one way to think about this is right now, if you go on eBay, the, the game tree is nine plies deep. So they've changed the way that this works to allow you to make four offers each as the buyer and the seller. And it's not clear that what's optimal in a seven ply game tree works in a nine ply game tree. I think rejecting early, that will probably transfer, but it, it's clear that you couldn't just launch this on eBay right now and expect it to achieve the same performance. That's what I was going to ask about, Eitan, if you thought about, um, even if it's just your simple agents, just kind of like getting a sample of Folgers coffee cans on eBay and kind of randomizing to whatever people would normally do as humans to like some algorithmically guided strategy. Now it, it's annoying that they changed the rules, but I was wondering if that was on the table or if you'd thought about taking Yeah, I mean, I really don't have the appetite to do uh, the work behind field experiments, but I think if somebody had the appetite, you know, an interesting manipulation would be to just give them, give sellers like high level, uh, guidance um, from this project and see if sellers that are exposed to that guidance, one, change their behavior and two, uh, perform better. And you could imagine Turk or lab versions as well that are less cumbersome to set up, right? Certainly. Well. Thanks, Aitan. Thanks, everybody else, for coming today. Really interesting, very engaging. Uh, and thanks to all of our audience for, for listening today. Uh, if all goes well, we will post this video to YouTube so you can uh, watch it again or share it with friends. And beyond that, uh, the Data Glava Seminar Series is going to take a break for the rest of the, uh, the fall term, but we will come back in the spring, and we hope to see you all at that time as well. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much.